Thank you very much and good morning everyone. Good morning and welcome back to Stanford. And those of you online, uh, don't you wish you were here? <laughs> so we wish you were here too, but we understand. Somebody has to work. So <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's, great to, uh, it's great to see a lot of old friends and, uh, and, and welcome you back. I quite enjoy speaking with, uh, with the alums because um, in contrast to what I do in my regular classes, I don't have to try to explain history as much. <laughs> and so, uh, so it, it actually, I'm serious, it's much easier because if you're talking on where great firms and where great leaders come from, there's been a lot of rewriting of history over the years. And so there's a little bit of grandpa explaining to the MBAs what really happened at certain times. And so uh, we'll tell a few of those stories. One thing I would like to say for you, though, is that anytime you want to ask a question, throw up your hand and come out or just come up to the mic and I'll just stop and, and go ahead and ask, ask the question. So I've structured my remarks to maybe raise a few ideas that you might find interesting, but also to allow for time for you to ask questions. So you can ask questions anytime by coming up to the microphone. And if you raise your hand, wave at me, make sure I see. So let's start with uh, an observation that uh, does come out of the research, but also just out of my own experience and probably out of your experience, we are really bad at predicting. <sighs> but we are really good at retrospectively rationalizing. <laughs> and, I, and, and I mean that not to be cynical. I am big on retrospective rationalization. And uh, I think it's an important part of leadership because you do have to make sense out of why people come to work. And in that sense, leaders are always looking back at things that have happened and explaining to people why it makes sense. But when you look at the track record, when you combine our talent at retrospective rationalization with our incredible inability to predict. So I remember in the classroom, it was 1993, and I was doing a case study of a, of a uh, software company that had made a product that could manipulate photographic images digitally, but on a low-end personal computer pretty efficiently. And uh, the entrepreneur was from France. He and his team had come over from Toulouse, decided they'd be here in Silicon Valley, and they had set up. His name was Bruno de Leon. Some of you may remember Bruno, a real whiz kid in software. And had come up with a uh, tremendous innovation that is still there in your, in your digital uh, technology that you carry around. And yeah, we had the normal class session where we do the case study and the students are asking questions and we're talking. And then at some point, with his amazing French accent, I wish I could talk like that, he, he, uh, he starts to say that, now remember what year this is, 1993. So the first browsers are just being created. We're not talking about the World Wide Web yet. There's some discussion of it. Of course, the internet and BitNet and other such networks already existed for scientists and academics, but the world's about to change. And he says, he says I, I envision a world where in just a couple of years, everyone's carrying around small computers with the main purpose being to trade photographs back and forth with each other. OK, now, the best part of this, and I have it on film, OK, is the look on my, so I'm standing kind of off to the side. You know how the privy, and we've got the visitor there, and he's sort of going on like this. And the students are looking at him, and they're looking at me, rolling their eyes, OK? And maybe some of you were in that class. And so <laughs> you could, at the end of the term, you know, when you get your, your uh, the professor gets graded by the students, right? So I'm looking through, and you know, well, Barnett's OK on this, and Barnett's you know, But get rid of this 
De Leon guy and get a real business in here because this guy's a whack job. You know, he's a crazy. <laughs> That's the problem. When we do predict the future, nobody believes it. Nobody believes it. Nobody believes it. And I remember, you know, sort of giving lectures on industrial evolution and uh, a lot of the things we talk about nowadays with disruption. We were talking about it, of course, even back in the 90s. And by about 96, I remember teaching the strategy, 95, uh, I was teaching the strategy core course, <clears throat> and uh, one of the MBAs was sitting in the right, you know, in the front center. She raises her hand, I'm going on about how industries change and new firms come in and old firms die, and, and she says, Professor Barnett. Now you have to realize, at that time, I had a lot more, red, well, just, <laughs> hair and red in my beard and everything. And, but nonetheless, I was an ancient man to her, and she said, uh, Professor Barnett, this sounds like a theory of the olden days. <laughs> so I, oh my gosh, it's great. I love teaching. I just love teaching here, really. I mean, it's, you know, when everyone in class feels like they are the embodiment of human evolution up to this moment. I mean, it's a kind of, you know... <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay. They're only outdone by, uh, yeah, when it comes to arrogance. So it's, uh, it's <laughs> so we're all in the same. <laughs> this is the pot calling the. So you know, I sort of looked at her and said, "Well, you know, what what do you mean?" <laughs> and she says, "Well, now everything's changed. Everything's stable. We have Microsoft." It's easy to forget that we thought we had finally reached equilibrium. You know all these theories you've learned about equilibrium? Everything goes to equilibrium this and equilibrium that and equilibrium price and equilibrium quantity and steady state technology and sustainable advance. I don't know where all these stable states are. I haven't seen them yet. I study growth and failure. I've been here since 91. Talk about being at the right place in the right time. There's no stability that I can find. And, uh, but at the time, it seemed that way because we had a giant firm that had, by then, probably, I don't know, 90, 95% of the desktop uh, organized for us. And things seemed to, to that uh, bright young woman as now we're all really stable. And if I would have told her, well, I'll tell you what I told her. I said, look, I don't know what's going to happen that's going to make us forget about Microsoft. But whatever it is, it's going to be bodacious. And the whole class looks at me like, that's all you got? <laughs> you get this bright question, and all you can use is an adjective? <laughs> the trouble is, back to predicting the future, if I could have gone forward and gotten in that car that takes you and looked at the world and then gone back and said, oh, you're not going to believe it. It's going to be this, it's going to be a college dorm project that where, and then that guy in 93, he appears to have been right. <laughs> you know, they were really just trading pictures of my grandson back and forth with, with, uh, with everyone. It's even if we could predict the future, we wouldn't believe it. This is a problem if you're a business school professor. <laughs> because, seriously, because if you think about it, if I'm in your shoes as an alumnus, uh, or if you think of the current students, they want to go out into the world and, and be great. And they want to understand that process. And part of becoming great is, is coming here and meeting each other and becoming part of that network. and. There's just that incredible life and, 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 and everything else that goes with it. But from a business school professor perspective, I want us to be able to give you some tools that will help you increase your chances of being great. But this is a world where we have proven ourselves to be very bad at predicting, which is a quandary if you're, if you're me and my colleagues like me. Well... Of course, we've known about this quandary for some time, and uh, we could all tell stories of companies that discovered their greatness. Uh, you may remember uh, Apple Computer, when it was a computer company. 
if we just look at the 1990 to, I'm sorry, uh, 2000 to 2016 period, never mind everything that went on before. A lot of folks in here, we could talk about that. That was also fascinating. But if you go just back to the year 2000, Steve Jobs was being rehabilitated. Right? He had just come back to Apple, had been fired several years before. On the East Coast, there's a business school which in 1996 featured Steve Jobs as the example of how not to lead. <laughs> it was their first case, the Donna Dubinsky case. He fired Donna uh, because she thought and talked at the same time. She, she leaned in. <laughs> and <laughs> so, downside of leading in is, and, and it, it, and of course she's amazing as a leader, went on to be a very successful entrepreneur, now venture capitalist. And so uh, that particular leadership development program, which is a very good program, uh, it, it led off with the Donna Dubinsky case, depicting that's not how to be a leader. I can tell you that by about 2004, when I would give lectures like this anywhere in the world, I often ask the question, who's a great leader to sort of warm up the crowd? And depending on where I am, you get really interesting answers. Um, see, in Zagreb, the answer was Genghis Khan. Okay. <laughs> Uh, in Peoria, it was Jesus Christ. Uh, the prophet Muhammad was raised as a possible uh, candidate for a great leader uh, in uh, Dubai. Uh, and I could go down the list. Uh, in Moscow, you can guess. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> that was Putin, but that's close. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, but they always say Steve Jobs. They always say Steve Jobs. So you go from being how not to lead in 95, 96, to being ranked eight years later alongside Jesus Christ, the prophet Muhammad, and Genghis Khan as one of the great leaders to have ever existed in human history. We are so bad at predicting. <laughs> we are so good at retrospectively rationalizing. And how easily we forget, and I think you can relate with me on this because you remember some of these times. So the iTunes introduced in 2001 with no iPod and no store, it was a jukebox where the strategy was to make the desktop computer more valuable so that maybe Apple could pull out of its 3% of market share doldrums versus the Windows-based Intel Windows PCs. That was actually the strategy at the time. A couple of years later, the store is introduced and Apple is shocked by the 10 million downloads of songs, they suddenly find out they're selling more music than they are computers in 2003. And the uh, strategy begins to change. Do you remember the hell freezes over announcement? Remember the strategy was to have the, the, uh, the Macintosh beat the PC on the desktop, but suddenly they're selling more music than they are computers. And that's just among people with a Macintosh because iTunes only functioned at that time on an Apple computer. So Steve Jobs stepped out and put up a big, uh, you know, the big, uh, you know, the black outfit and the big screen with the, uh, and it said, hell freezes over. Anybody remember what they did? They released iTunes on Windows, that's right. They released iTunes on Windows. And immediately, within two months, there were another 15 million downloads, and they completely shifted the strategy. Let's not worry about, in fact, within a couple of years, they would drop the name computer from their name. They become a music company. It's often the case that we discover greatness. What's interesting, if they had stayed to plan that wouldn't have happened. If they had stayed to plan, that wouldn't have happened. Of course, we all have plans. But the interesting thing on the leadership side was the ability of their leadership not to predict the future, but to create a system that discovers that future. And of course, I raise Apple as an example of that, but there are plenty of other examples. I would guess 
that right now if we went around this room, we would have exa- dozens and dozens and, and dozens of examples of your own companies or, or companies you've been with uh, in your careers that have discovered greatness. Uh, because in the years uh, since about 1985, plenty of research has been done to trace the histories of firms. And it looks like it is not the exception to see the likes of an Apple. Of course, Apple is possibly the most valuable company in the world right now, is quite exceptional. But that story of discovering greatness is the rule, not the exception. Uh, let's talk about Semex. We're in a theater that is uh, uh, endowed by Semex, and so we're required to talk about Semex. So, <laughs> so <laughs> Mr. Zambrano. So no, seriously though, sorry, I, I love the Semex case because everybody, when they hear these discovery stories, you know, Airbnb, it starts out with three techies and they lose a roommate. And if you're a techie, whenever you have a need, you write a web page, right? So if you're hungry, you write a web page. You're lonely, you write a web page, you know. You, <laughs> So they lost a roommate, let's write a web page, right? So, uh, and sure enough, people start landing on it. They want to rent the couch and, oh gosh, we can make this a business. And then they want to make it so that at events like uh, South by Southwest or uh, they were politicos, you know, so at around 2007, 2008 at the Democratic National Convention, the first of the Obama conventions, I said, oh, we'll use this website to help people find a place when they go to the convention. Yeah, it really didn't work very well for event organizing. It, it turns out people plan when they go to conventions and get a room and just show up in town. Oh my God, a room, <laughs> right? <laughs> They'll make a web page. So, the, <laughs> you know, the, the uh, and one of the big problems they had making it work were all these people were trying to use the website just to rent from each other. And it was, it, and then they were trying to figure out how could we stop this? <laughs> Don't they understand our strategy? We're trying to do event. If they had succeeded in their plan, they would have been worth millions. <laughs> I think we, okay, that reaction tells me you have some sense of what Airbnb is worth now. And I don't know, is it 30 billion? I don't know what the number is now. More than Marriott. At some point they said, wait a minute, this bothersome problem we have of all these people trying to use the website. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, we're trying to improve the desktop. Uh, wait a minute, we're selling how much music? This discovery process goes on in company after company. And a lot of people think it's only tech companies. Happened at Semex. And some of you will remember this because we have a, an age old Semex case. I still keep in the curriculum because I love it. I'm, uh, people think I'm required to teach it, but I'm not. I, I love it. Uh, it, it uh, Mr. Zambrano, the senior, had, had gone uh, uh, decades ago, had, had acquired a couple of companies in, in Spain. The intent, the strategy, was to smooth out the business cycle for Semex. Right? Because it, cement is very based on construction, very cyc- cyclical, high fixed cost business you're operating only in Mexico, then you're really beholden to that business cycle. And he thought, well, well you know, if we, if we were in multiple countries, we would have counter-cyclical movement of the business cycle. Um, and that was especially difficult at the time because now we're a little bit better with financial heading, uh, hedging for that kind of uh, dealing with that kind of cyclicality, but finance markets had a little more trouble with that at the time. Semex, as uh, one of the Mexican grupos at the time, had also more trouble accessing some of those international finance markets. They get over to Spain to do the typical post-merger integration. They send over their team of uh, managers and engineers trained at Monterrey Tech. And these folks are whiz kids when it comes to state-of-the-art manufacturing, operations, logistics, supply chains, they put in truck tracking, they clean up the accounting systems, they dramatically improve the performance of the Spanish facilities. Well, it turns out most cement companies in the world decades ago were sleepy kind of monopolies because of the nature of cement and transportation costs. They're typically the only game in town, often government sponsored and so forth. And Semex was vastly more efficient because of the fact that they hire so much out of Monterrey Tech. And, uh, 
at that point, Zambrano says, wait a minute. If we're that good that we can dramatically improve the performance of those Spanish acquisitions, let's write up a, a set of routines on that. And, and now let's do it to ourselves. It's one of the few firms I know who has had the courage to post-merger integrate themselves. Right, because we all like to post-merger integrate other people. And some of you have done that or been on the receiving end of it, right? But this company said, look, if we can do it to them, we've got, we've got plants and facilities we acquired around Mexico, so they dramatically improved their own performance. And then as many of you know, went on a, on a, a very long run of acquisitions where they would go in, do post-merger integration, dramatically improve the efficiency of operations. The world's finance markets fall in love with them. What becomes their strategy was discovered. And that's the cement industry. So it's not only in tech. You see the discovery of why you're great even in the cement industry. You shop at Trader Joe's. You know where they started? What they were, you haven't, well, you, you, people don't shop at, at Trader Joe's. Okay, yeah, because I know there's more wine drinkers out there than, but it's just like, you're smiling, if nothing else, you must be. Uh, <laughs> you know, they started out selling cigarettes and ammunition. <laughs> Seriously, I know, I know Joe, or knew Joe Colomb. I had case studies on it. And that's how they started, just went through an evolution. Now they're selling boutique honey and names of cheese I can't pronounce. <sighs> Well, you would, by, by the way, don't go there now looking for cigarettes and ammunition, okay? <laughs> it's a, you'd be arrested uh, for the cigarettes. Uh, the ammunition would be okay. <laughs> I think it's America. But, uh, <laughs> sorry, I digress. <laughs> so, we're, so it's interesting. Plenty of non-technology firms go through it, too. Now, here's the point, though, that uh, makes business school professors happy about this. It isn't just dumb luck. You, know, you tell enough of these stories and people start thinking, oh, well, what Barnett's getting at is it's a crapshoot. It turns out some people tend to get consistently more lucky than others. At, what, at some point, it stops being luck when some people are having all the luck and some people aren't. When some companies are repeatedly going through a discovery process and some are not. And that's because the discovery process, while it is not good at predicting the outcome, does follow a pattern. It always follows the same pattern. Regardless of where you see it happen, three things always happen in the, in the discovery process. And if we understand these three things that happen in the discovery process, we as leaders can make it more likely that our own company get lucky more than it should. And so I want to talk about those three things. So it's fun to tell stories about companies that discovered something much greater than they had planned to do, but it's a lot more fun to drill down and think about what are those three underlying processes that always seem to go on when companies are good at, the pro at discovery. And so I wanna, I wanna talk about that. But if people have questions, sometimes this is a nice time. You know, we're kind of into the storytelling and now you're all sitting and you've had your coffee. So if there's questions, you can, you can that's fine. I'll just keep talking. You want to know the three things, so it, it, it's, a, <laughs> it's a, and they're in a book that I wrote. Is it? <laughs> no, I actually I did write a book, but you should not buy my book. I got to tell you, do not buy my book. My wife, God love Yvette, I've been together for thirty-five years, and so uh, she read my book and described it as having been written not to be read. Now, I know that sounds like the snarky wife comment. Maybe it is a snarky wife comment, but it, it's not just a, I think it's, it, it really, I kind of took a sober look at that book, uh, you know, once I kind of was clear from it and realized she was absolutely right. That book is filled with econometrics and it's meant to prove a point to, to my colleagues, statistically. So you really don't want to buy the book. Uh, but it did, make me, it did make me think that I have to find a way to, to give the ideas that were in the book and, and in other things that I've written uh, a more accessible presentation. And so, uh, so I will tell you about my website. Um, but it's free. But, 
But the reason I like people to go on my website is that I love to get the comments back and it helps me. Basically what I do now is I put all my teaching notes online. I tried to do it a few years ago and it freaked out the intellectual property people here because they were all on sort of Stanford letterhead and I was just giving them away. So I had to rewrite everything on a blog, but it's the, my teaching notes. So, uh, so they're available everywhere except China. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not sure. <laughs> Which is, I go over there and lecture all the time. I'm not quite sure why. Anyway, they, so it's, uh, it's just my name, Barnett uh, Talks, because I do. And then all my, all my teaching notes are on there. If you like it, spoon-fed. You can get it that way too, and then I can, uh, and then when I make mistakes or or whatever else, and people correct me, and that's uh, so I'm being a little selfish with that, but at least the ideas are free there, so I put my ideas there. Uh, but I will tell. Let's talk about those three things. Okay, let's talk about those three things. And the first thing we need to talk about. <clears throat> comes down to what happens when you have a good idea, an innovative idea. Now, when you have an innovative idea, does everybody have to agree with your idea for it to be a good one? No, of course not. I mean, in fact, it's obviously a rhetorical question, right? You can see why. If nothing else, you wouldn't come to a Stanford event and expect, no. I only want to think about something if everyone, you know, it's kind of being here, you know, it's kind of all. When you have an innovative idea, what's the first thing you do? You tell somebody, exactly, you tell somebody. What if they don't like it? What do you do? You tell somebody else. Absolutely, there's plenty of research on this. That's exactly what happened. Hopefully, you tell somebody else, hopefully, who hasn't talked to the first person you told because. Uh, it's interesting, though, because less than 60 seconds ago, you told me it really didn't matter. But it appears to matter a lot. If, it, if we can have a good idea, regardless of whether everybody's agreeing with us, why are we trying to find people who agree with us? What's going on? What's the, what is it about having an it? Why are we feeling compelled to ask other people if we think our innovative idea could be right, even if they don't agree with us. What's going on? OK, so we're looking for validation. We're looking for the, ah, we want to be able to execute it, right? So we, we might want validation, but the other side is we might want to make sure we could do. So if they disagree, it's not so much that we think we're wrong. We just realize we got a bit of a wall to get past to get it right. We we're, we have, we've got to line our ducks up, which is an interesting. Um, well, in fact, let's let's play with this idea a little bit. Let's play with this idea a little bit. When you have an innovative idea, you might be right. Can you see that? Okay. But you might be wrong. You might be wrong. This isn't like good, bad. It's like correct, incorrect, OK? <laughs> you might be right, but you might be wrong. And you know it. it. And you think about it. When it comes to innovation, if you know you're right, it's probably not an innovative idea. Right? If you got to kind of, it's a. Uh, uh, so when you ask other people and they're agreeing with you, you'd like to know whether it's giving you a clue about whether you're right or wrong. The trouble is, you don't know. Maybe they don't know either. And so you know in your heart when you ask other people that if they're agreeing with you, all it's really telling you is that the idea is consensus. That's all it's really telling you. And, that, and if you're getting pushback, all it's really telling you is that it's a non-consensus idea. Whether it's right or wrong, what, one thing for sure, I'm getting a lot of pushback. This is a non-consensus idea. And the problem, 
with discovering greatness is that all four of those are possible. And we know it. We know it every time we're thinking of something innovative. We know that that's the case. So let's work through those possibilities. And the best way to structure it is to start with the assumption that you're right. Now, you can't know you're right and have it be innovative, but let's assume somehow you did know that you were right. So if you knew you were right, where would you rather be? What's the argument? So I've heard both coming up. Uh, so what's the argument for consensus? OK, everybody agrees with you, so we're back to the execution point. We're definitely going to be able to execute this. What's the argument for non-consensus? OK, we could make it better through the dialectic. Okay, okay, yeah. You'll certainly be out in front, right? You're going to be out in front. And it's, but it's going to be hard to execute. we got to give the execution people that. See, now you're the execution guy. For the rest of the day, you're like Mr. Execution, uh, which, is, which can be good. Uh, so if, this is the way I think of it. This is going to be hard to execute, but if you do execute, you can tell I'm not a finance professor. There'd be a Greek letter here. Instead, the symbol I'm going to use is, 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 uh, is uh, <laughs> I'm a strategy professor. <laughs> it's, this is a great place to be, right? This is a great place. This is Erwin Jacobs. Erwin Jacobs and, and uh, his fellow scientist Viterbi started Qualcomm based on CDMA technology, a wireless technology that was very controversial. Uh, and a very non-consensus idea. DARPA had given up on CDMA. They thought that it was so complicated. They created it with, uh, you know, sponsored the research that created uh, code division, multiple access technology, and, and had, uh, they wanted it to uh, help encode messages that the Soviet Union could then not intercept. It's so fun to be able to talk to a crowd who understands what the Soviet Union is, because I normally then have to explain <laughs> that there was this empire it was a giant empire. It's true. It actually existed, you know. And then, <laughs> it's, <laughs> and, but it's very. And they'll say you're talking about Russia. Well, no. So uh, they so gave up on it. It was so complicated. They put it out in the public domain. They said, oh, even the Russians can't figure this out. I mean, it's just you know, we'll just put it out there. And so a very, very non-consensus. Banned in Europe because of it. Banned in Europe. Uh, because they wanted TDMA only for GSM, which would create a real problem when the smartphone comes along, since CDMA was a lot better at carrying data. And we're so bad at predicting, you know, but we're very good at retrospectively rationalizing. And so they own a lot of IP at Qualcomm, and that leads to this uh, outcome. Because when you're the only game, when you're the only one who thinks you're right, then you might end up owning a lot of the IP because nobody else is even going to do research on it. And now, now here you can execute. The trouble is everybody's executing on it, right? Which, from a strategic perspective, it's not a bad thing, but we're all doing it. So this you can execute. This is going to be hard to execute, but if you can, the payoff is, is my, now. What if you're wrong? Where do you want to be if you're wrong? Absolutely, consensus. No big story. I <laughs> just. Humans, when they're wrong, do not want to be alone. <laughs> right? It's as simple as that. It's just as simple as that. I mean, you know, <laughs> your kid asks you, and my wife and I have six kids, so I've had this question come up a number of times, or uh, uh, statement come up a number of times. Your kid comes home and says, Dad, this was the latest rendering of it, everybody at school, yeah, never a good start to any conversation. <laughs> Everybody at school had a lot of trouble on the history test. <laughs> Is your daughter suddenly concerned about the state of education in Palo Alto? It's kind of <laughs> you know, she's calibrating you, right? She's trying to get you over here because then we can talk about, you know, and then it's not so bad, you know? OK, I lost money in 2000. But we all lost money in 2000. So for me, it was web van. I don't know what yours was, but you know. <laughs> but we all, you know what I mean? This guy, he's a fool. This guy's a fool. 
He, we told him he was wrong. He did it anyway. And he's wrong. And the problem with discovering great business, and the, what, what one of the, it's the number one problem with, with the discovery process is that humans fear being a fool much more than they hope to be a genius. And as a result, they're quiet about their non-consensus ideas. They're asking people. They realize it's non-consensus. And in fact, you should ask yourself this. Your people in your organization, are they quiet about their non-consensus ideas for fear they may, might be seen a fool? And if so, what does that say about your leadership? Because some places are safer than others when it comes to non-consensus behavior. Some people, this is a career ender. Some places, this is a career ender. And if this is a career ender, you're never going to hear that. And this brings up the first property of all systems that discover greatness. And that, that is they are systems that generate variability. They generate variability. Now notice I didn't say they generate greatness. I said they generate variability. And let, let me explain why I put it that way. You can tell I'm an old chalkboard guy. If you think about the innovative process, all innovative processes, including companies, are producing innovations. Now, an innovation isn't a good thing. It just means it's a new thing. It might be amazing. It might be foolish. And the point on innovation is we don't know until we try the difference between folly and genius. Remember the stories of Bruno de Leon in 1993 and the end of Industrial Revolution in 1995 and how we're so bad at predicting. With that lesson in mind, new ideas, new possibilities come along. They might be foolish. They might be genius. The year that Google was found, I don't know what the distribution looks like. You know, that's optimistic. Maybe the distribution is that there's a lot more foolishness out there. I don't know what the distribution looks like. The year that Google was uh, founded, if you look in the uh, archived press at the time, everybody knew that search was not a business. We had seen the failure of Alta Vista and uh, Excite and Lycos and you name your favorite dead search engine. And so there was a lot of talk that, well, search is necessary. Maybe it's a public utility. You know, we'll have uh, PG&S. Right? <laughs> or PG&ES, I don't know. Now my marketing colleagues tell me that search is clearly the most valuable business model in the history of humankind. We are so bad at predicting. And we are so good at retrospectively rationalizing. And so at the time, we don't know what's here or what's here. And this is generally true, by the way, this is generally true. I mean, it, it, it plagues all attempts to increase innovation. It plagues all attempts to increase innovation. And, and in companies, you'll often see a desire to have more innovation, but only to have smart innovation. Now, can we really get away with that? Yeah, I don't think we can either. I don't think we can either. Uh, the city-state of Singapore, one of the great miracle economies of the world, has a lot of different uh, programs to try to improve its economy. It's an amazing place. Some of you may have spent time in Singapore, maybe from Singapore. But they actually tried to do this, and, and their experiment is worth thinking about. They noticed that Singapore was very efficient but wasn't being innovative enough. And a few years ago, had one of their campaigns focus on increasing spontaneity. So they wanted to bring people in from the arts and music and create more of a I guess a Greenwich Village feel uh, to Singapore. Uh, 
Now, the trouble with being a street musician in Singapore, <laughs> OK, this is, I'm remembering my uh, youth. I, all my college and graduate school was at Berkeley. So, uh, and so sometimes you want to take a field trip up there. Not all together. <laughs> <laughs> Not all, they'll know if <laughs> you get somebody out, at, uh, the dean out in front, and you'll all go up. But go just independently up to Berkeley and check out the street musicians. It's not a pretty sight, you know. And, and so when the street musicians started showing up in Singapore, the cleanly, they have a cleanliness campaign. They, they took them aside, issued them a poncho and, and a playlist. They could play Peter, Paul, and Mary lyrics. <laughs> and so this is true. This is actually what happened. I think Puff the Magic Dragon had a meaning that, that was not understood by the... Uh, <laughs> we understood it in Berkeley, I can tell you. <laughs> so you see what's going on. They say, we want innovation, but we've been to Berkeley. Okay, and so they say, no, what we're going to have is we're going to have innovation, but we're not going to have any of this. We're not going to have any of this. That's much better. That's much, uh-oh, oh my gosh, what happened? You see what happens is when we try to control the innovation process and have smart innovation and get rid of all that, we think we're pushing up the mean. What we're doing is we're pushing down the variance. When we think we're managing up the mean, we're actually managing down the variance. Because by virtue of getting rid of foolishness, what we're actually getting rid of is non-consensus behavior. Because remember, we don't know the difference between genius and folly before the fact. All we know before the fact is the difference between consensus and non-consensus behavior. Bob Dylan can't sing. I think he just won the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I think we'll cut him some slack on his ability to hit every note in the scale. And I'm sure we would have cleaned him out. You see what I'm getting at here? There's even a, there's a historian of science who has looked at all of Albert Einstein's work and found mathematical, actually just arithmetic errors. I tell you what, if you can come up with a general theory, we'll cut you some slack on your arithmetic. Right? And it's, it's, that's the idea that, you know, in the search for genius, if you want genius, look for systems that create foolishness. If, if you find a system that's creating foolishness, there might be a chance of genius. If you're finding a system that never does anything foolish, there's no way you're getting genius. So that's the first property of these systems. If you want your organization to, to discover greatness, it has to do something different. Not only different, it has to do something different that is non-consensus. So start thinking about business plan competitions. The consensus pick, not genius. In fact, what I want to see in a business plan competition is the plan that generates the biggest argument, right? The future Irwin Jacobs. You kind of see where I'm going with that. So you got to manage for variance. Now, managing for variance is something you can do in some companies you can't do in others. There, I get kind of, with being an ancient professor, you get more phone calls uh, to go talk to people in companies. So I get calls all the time from people who should really be behaving predictably. And they say, oh, we want some of this innovation stuff. I said, no, you really don't. We really don't, you do not want me to come talk to your people. I was called recently by an organization on the other side of the world that runs nuclear power plants. <laughs> yeah, you don't want me near them. <laughs> I want you to do it so predictably. I want you to be Mr. Consensus, right? The guy who flies my airplane, the person who flies my airplane, I, yeah, I want them to take off and land the exact same way every time, right? So there's plenty of context where I don't want experimentation and foolishness. And, and I'm not going to kid myself and say that I'm only going to have smart innovation. I'm going to say that a system has to create variance in order to... So that's the biggest job, right? Job one, variability. If, if, you, if your system creates variation, you have a chance of discovering greatness. The second point is you have to select from that variation. And that's what all those little stories were about Airbnb and Semex and Apple and 
you name your favorite organization, Trader Joe's, your favorite organization that discovered its, its greatness, leadership saw the possibility and was able to select that new possibility and turn it into a strategy. And it's interesting. If Apple had stayed with its strategy, it would have been a computer company. It probably would be history. Certainly wouldn't be the most valuable company on earth. Airbnb, same thing, would have been worth a few million if they had nailed it on event lodging, organizing, and so forth. But often what we discover in the process of creating variation has much more potential than whatever it was we were planning to begin with. And that process of selection is typically iterative, where we start with our strategy, try to see how it works in the market, and then update our strategy on this, in this iterative way. And if we see strategy less as a planning process and more as a discovery process, now we have a chance of turning that, those, that variability coming from our people, those new ideas, into uh, into reality. And the, the third part is retention or growth, where we retain the ideas that work best and we grow them. And that's a tough part because if this is over time and that's performance, everybody knows when you change strategy what happens to your performance. It goes down. And it takes a while to get a great strategy's performance up. Right? So the performance is going to go up only after we survive the, great, the J curve. Well, how are we going to get through that decline in performance as we're going in a new direction? We have to be able to get our people to understand the logic of that new strategy. And that's leadership looking forward. We connect the dots looking backwards. That's the discovery process right here. We connect the dots looking backwards, as Steve Jobs said in his, I guess it was 2008, I think, his commencement address here. He said, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. Looking forward, you have to believe that the dots are going to connect. And so leadership has to give its people the logic that has them believe that that's possible. You see where great leaders come from. Great leaders are people who understand that it is not their job to know the future. It is their job to create a system that discovers that future. And in leading that system, leaders perform two functions. Looking back, they retrospectively rationalize. They make sense out of why your people are doing what they're doing. Looking forward, they turn that into a logic, a strategy that helps their people survive the tough times when they try to change the world. Because changing the world is difficult, and it takes time. But when you persist, you create something great. Where else have you heard variation, selection, and retention? It's the theory of evolution. It is, economies evolve just like the biosphere. Economies evolve just like the biosphere. The difference is that in this process, we play a role. It isn't blind variation, it's variation among humans, guided by leaders, in some cases, who make non-consensus behavior seem criminal, and in other cases, who encourage that. It's selection, but selection mediated by leaders who create systems that try and learn. In some organizations, that learning, because it's fraught with failure, damns people's careers. In other organizations, that learning is seen as constructive. And it's retention in the form of growth, which in some organizations is only safe if you can turn over a result in the next week or quarter. And don't blame the public markets. Always look to leadership. Because the public markets, like any capital market, have to be persuaded that that logic makes sense to believe long enough to get you there. So whenever you see yourself pointing at someone else, turn that finger back and ask yourself as a leader, what role do you play in this process? Are you increasing your organization's chances of becoming great? Because it isn't random luck. 
It's all about great leadership. So with that, we have five minutes. Any questions? Well, okay, the question was, why was I blocked from China? Um, <laughs> I'm not blocked from China, so I go to China uh, uh, freely. Well, not freely, I gotta get a visa and do the whole thing. But um, you, it's just, you can't, I, I, I'm not really sure why. I don't think I said anything too uh, outlandish, but you can't reach my blog from China. So, yeah, no, no. I wish there was a great, really interesting story where I had to, like with Tom Cruise getting in a jet and escaping, but it was just really, they just don't like my ideas. Uh, given your lecture, can you give us some good questions to ask at the next lecture on the 2016 presidential election? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. No, I'm not going to say anything. So <laughs> we're just going to we're just going <laughs> we're just going to let somebody ask another question. <laughs> so cuz you're going to have a whole talk on that with people who who uh okay, it looks like we have a questioner coming up here and then I'll I'll come to you. Go ahead. Uh question about measurement in this whole process, yes. right? So when you're a lot of these company examples, you said they were measuring things and they realized then to shift paths. Yes. But measurement always has a bias, right? It focuses you, as, focuses you on something. So if you could just talk about how that relates to all this. Sure, sure. That's a great question. So folks who are really familiar with this part of the process understand that it's become a, a, a science or a pseudoscience uh, these days where you look at the feedback from testing. You try to fail fast and cheap. You look at the feedback from testing and then update on the basis of that feedback. And those of you who've studied the engineering of searching for optimized, you know, so of local search and iterative optimization, if, if those terms are appealing to you, you know that this kind of uh, measurement suffers from a variety of problems that, that often are talked about as bias. Um, so probably the biggest problem is that it keeps you extremely focused on short-term results. So if you look here, if we're doing A-B testing of our new idea here, we're gonna pivot. People love pivoting these days. <laughs> you gotta just go have a glass of wine on University Avenue and listen to the young people talk and they all say the word pivot all the time. <laughs> and so the recipe is that you try something, it doesn't work, you pivot, you're rich. That's the, that's kind of the, that's, that's the recipe. So the problem is that great firms, if they pivot here, they never get there. And so you, you, the, you do want to pivot if the very logic that you think is true here is failing its test. But if all you're doing is just looking at a result without thinking through the logic of the business, you want to think again before you, you pivot. A second problem you can run into is that even if the results are speaking to the direction of your firm, you can get false positives and you can get false negatives, right? So a false positive is where you think you did a good job, but it actually it's, it's, the thing you did is a bad thing. You just got a false positive. Uh, and a false negative is where what you're doing is a, is, a, is, a, uh, is a good idea, but your results are saying it was a bad idea. That's a false negative. Now, what's better, a false negative or a false positive? Yeah, everybody loves false negatives better because that means you're right. But here's the problem. False positives are self-correcting. False negatives are not. Because if I get a false negative, I'll pivot. And I won't realize I was right. A false positive, I'm going to do it again. And then I'm going to find out, hold on. <laughs> Turns out, that was not correct. So you actually get a larger sample. The great Professor March, some of you had when you were here, has an article on the issue that the young man raised. People don't read the article so much. They should. They definitely read the title. Learning from samples of one or fewer. <laughs> don't you wish you had written the paper with that title? I don't, like, even if, you know what I mean? It's, 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 and that's exactly what happens with a, with a, with a false negative is you say, oh my gosh, I've done that, and boy, you should see what happened. I'm pivoting. 
And so you want to run the test again. There's a, there's a, a sense in which we have to try to get to a sample size that resembles something decent. Of course, big data companies have massive amounts of data and can do that. But when it comes to strategy, we'll often run the test just once. Uh, and, uh, and, then, and then shy away. And so we'll come to this gentleman, and then we'll come to this gentleman, and I think then we'll probably have to close. So, yeah, go ahead. Could you explain how or even if your, your theory would apply to either the not-for-profit sector or, more importantly, government? Sure, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, it, it, it applies to, to both. This way of looking at the world does apply to both. Um, and... Uh, but what changes is the criterion, or the criteria, for deciding on success and failure. That obviously in the examples I've been giving, I've talked a lot about a market, and I've talked about success and failure in that market, and this performance presumably is market performance, and we talked about companies uh, being profitable and growing and so forth. In the not-for-profit sector, experimentation and uh, performance also have, they do have to have, there has to be some kind of returns, but those returns are a function of the legitimacy of the organization. So legitimacy is the currency of the not-for-profit world. And if I consider the activities of a particular organization to be especially legitimate and praiseworthy, then funding sources and people who give grants and other kinds of support will fall in line. And that's also true in government. Legitimacy is the currency in the public sector generally. And so if you think about it, legitimacy creates a real problem here because often the experiments that go awry look illegitimate. And we often see risk averseness in the public center, sector precisely because we're worried about being illegitimate. And so public sector leaders also have to think about creating contexts where it's safe to deviate, uh, even though that might seem like it would threaten uh, legitimacy. And uh, uh, similarly with selection, if we go through a process of fail fast and cheap and we try different things in the public sector or in not-for-profit organizations and we fail, grant-giving organizations, other kinds of donors and funders are gonna look and say, well, what's, what's the story here? We're seeing a, a high failure rate. We would like to see a success rate. And what's, where you're hurting there is, once again, in your legitimacy. And the inability to grow comes down to the fact that when you're busy changing the world, you can have a legitimacy crisis during this period as well. So I think you could take the same ideas, and those of you who work in not-for-profit and public sector, simply translate them into the performance metrics that are appropriate for you, because evolution happens in the not-for-profit sector too. Evolution and discovery is the way of our world. Sir. Bill Leedy, MBA 71. Good job. You're great. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I propose to all of us that the greatest business opportunity of our time is transforming the world's largest industry from 85% fossil to 100% renewables mm -hmm. as quickly as we prudently and profitably can do that. Where is the great leadership in the, in this, in the energy industry sure. and uh, why are they so slow sure. in picking up? Time's running out. Well, I applaud that question and I'm... I'm uh, and I'm thrilled to have it be our last question because I think it's, it's prob probably the most important question we face today. Um, and, and I think we, we need leadership on many fronts. Um, a large number of scholars at the, at the Woods uh, Institute here are, are working on leadership in various sectors. And our scientists have obviously led the way, Chris Field and others, author of the IPCC reports over the years on climate change. Um, but we also have a big push uh, in earth sciences and uh, among a number of the faculty in the business school and in engineering trying to show the way. But it, it is going to, to require a lot of effort, a lot of collective effort. I think we're to the point we're in this period. And the difficulty is many of the changes that we need to make in order to move to uh, a, an economy that allows for sustainability worldwide um, are going to, uh, they're going to be difficult to implement in the sense that during this period, they're going to create a lot of problems and difficulties in performance. And it takes a great deal of courage to execute on ideas like that. And while we're making progress, we really are not making progress fast enough. Um, and and the, uh, 
for some years, I ran here at the school an executive program on this topic. And we brought in business leaders, government leaders, uh, and leaders from social movement organizations and not-for-profits, all three in equal numbers. And the first day was always the scientists. And then the other days of the program were the economists and sociologists and, and other people in the business school talking about what we can do based on. But I can tell you, by the end of that first day, it was a pretty sobering message. And that, and that message remains very sobering. And you have to remember that the truth is the truth, whether you want to hear it or not. And the important part of, first cha of changing the world is first to get your head around what's true. And what's true is that we do face something uh, that is monumental in terms of a problem when it comes to moving away from the fossil fuel economy and the need to deal with, cl with climate change. Now, translating that into action depends on where you work. And as a leader, where you're, gonna, where you're gonna do this. In the public sector, there's some people trying to show leadership. In the private sector, many of our alums are trying to show leadership. It sounds like this gentleman is also showing leadership uh, in, his, in his part of the world. I think faculty and researchers need to show leadership as well. When you have a movement across all of those fronts of people showing leadership, uh, we have an amazing ability as a species to solve problems and come up with greatness in ways that we never would have expected. So I think this is a domain where my message that we're not here to predict the future, we're here to, just to create the systems that discover that future uh, is a message that needs to be heard. Thank you very much and thank you all for coming back. Thank you.